Welcome Facebook users to our 11th TIFF Talk. I'm Karen Gerth with Endogastric Solutions, and I have the pleasure of having Dr. Yvonne Hardin here with me today from Gastroenterology Associates of Northern Virginia. He is also the medical director at the GI Lab at Innova Fairfax Hospital. We also have one of his patients here, Mary Brown, and we're gonna hear more from her during uh, this broadcast. We're gonna hear about her journey. Um, let's just jump right in and get started. Um, I'll start with you, Dr. Harnden. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us and give us a clinical explanation of what GERD is? So GERD is really symptomatic acid reflux or reflux of any, any material uh, from the stomach into the esophagus. Um, so classically that's caused by uh, sort of a, a dysfunction of the valve at the bottom of the esophagus. The esophagus is the food pipe that brings food down into the stomach and normally there's a valve there that opens when food passes through and then closes after food has passed through to prevent abnormal reflux of material, so material going up the, the food pipe to cause symptoms. Um, that could be acid or bile or a combination of those things. Um, so GERD is, the, uh, is sort of the disease caused by that, so symptoms of acid reflux. That might be your typical symptoms of heartburn, regurgitation, uh, regurgitation would be the feeling of material, whether it's food or liquid, coming up into the chest or the back of the throat. And GERD is usually sort of defined by uh, having symptoms frequently enough that it becomes bothersome to a patient. Thank you. Um, so Mary, if you don't mind asking you, I know that he mentioned some of the symptoms of GERD. Uh, what were some of the symptoms that you were experiencing? For approximately two years or more, I had a lot of post nasal drip, runny nose, losing my voice, having to clear my throat, sinus infections. I was on multiple um, antibiotics and I went to an ENT, I went to an allergist. I, for a while I thought I was lactose intolerant because I had to keep clearing my throat, but lactate didn't help. And once the antibiotics were finished, the infection would come back. And then one of the doctors said he thought it might be reflux. Um, so before I saw Dr. Harden, I was on the PPI med, and I think I was on four different ones. And um, during that time, I got pneumonia. Okay. And it was really bad. I had, my whole side was black and blue from coughing. But I didn't know what was the cause. And then at the, at the ER, they did a MRI and said, you're, esophagus when you're lying down is open and it should be closed. So I um, was in the hospital the first time with pneumonia for five days and then I did everything they told me to do. I saw a GI doctor and a lung doctor and um, the ENT and I got pneumonia again about five weeks later. Oh my goodness. The first time they said it was aspiration pneumonia so I inhaled reflux. Mm -hmm. The second time it was from complications from the first time. So after I'd been on um, the PPIs, they didn't seem to be helping the symptoms, and I didn't want to keep on taking antibiotics, um, and I didn't want to keep on taking PPIs. So I saw another doctor in the practice, and he recommended this procedure. Oh, wonderful. And, and Dr. Hardin, um, speaking of PPIs, um, what are the long-term effects of, of being on prolonged uh, PPI use? So in general, PPIs are thought to be safe. These are proton pump inhibitors. They act on the stomach cells to reduce the amount of acid that's being secreted. Uh, they don't totally eliminate acid from the stomach, but they reduce it enough that the symptoms may improve. Um, there are some concerns, like with any medication, about long-term use. And more recently, there have been studies that have brought up some, uh, some concerns with the medication. Um, generally speaking, there are few if no side effects to them, but there are some concerns that they may um, have other consequences long term. So for some folks who are taking these medications, they need them every day um, or even twice a day in higher doses to get control of their symptoms. So that's when we start to worry that there could be potential long term effects. There are um, some known side effects. Um, Mary had pneumonia. That There is a uh, increased risk of pneumonia from aspirated material if you're on a proton pump inhibitor. 
Now, maybe because the, the material that's coming up and is going down the wrong pipe to the lungs is not as sort of sterilized by the, by the acid as it would have been. Um, there is also an increased risk of C. diff infection uh, in some patients, especially if they're prone to that. And that is a bacterial infection that causes diarrhea. So those are known complications of proton pump inhibitors. There are some concerns about a decreased absorption rate of magnesium and calcium. That's not very common, but it can happen. And uh, so that is a, another potential complication of the medications. There are a number of studies that have brought up associations with other medical problems. So people who take a proton pump inhibitor may uh, you know, look like they have uh, an increased risk of certain other conditions when they do these studies. <clears throat> so for these studies, they'll look at a, a, a registry of medical records. They'll see that more patients are with heart disease, for example, may be taking proton pump inhibitors. And then you can draw an association there, and, and it may look like proton pump in inhibitors may cause heart disease. Other conditions that have been associated with this are dementia, potentially kidney disease. Uh, but if you look at the way the studies are done, these are not actually studies that you can draw a conclusion that the medication has caused these problems. So the way that they're done is not in a clean way where you can prove a cause and effect from the medications. Most of us feel that proton pump inhibitors in general are safe, but there are these concerns that have been raised about potential complications. Excellent. Um, so I know we've kind of talked about um, PPIs. Uh, what are some other treatment? options for GERD? So for anybody with, <coughs> with GERD, uh, we'll typically start with basic lifestyle modification, as we call it. So there are some dietary factors that may play a role. Uh, some, some patients will notice classic trigger foods. There are uh, a number of these that, if you work on diet, can help um, improve symptoms. Coffee, for example, or caffeine is a big trigger for a lot of people. Um, acidic foods, spicy foods, those are somewhat irritating in the esophagus, so if you have reflux, having those types of foods come back into the esophagus can be, can be painful. Uh, fatty foods and sweets, those tend to cause more reflux as well. There's others like peppermint, onions, so there's a whole list of foods that, that may cause symptoms. Uh, and we have some guidelines based around this, so we encourage patients to avoid food triggers that they've noticed cause their symptoms, but uh, in general it's difficult to avoid all of the foods on that list and most patients don't really need to do that. Um, in addition to that, we encourage patients not to eat too close to bedtime, maybe eat smaller meals a little bit more frequently to avoid overfilling the stomach. So those are some of the, the basic dietary interventions. Uh, some folks benefit from elevating the head of their bed at night to get gravity on their side, prevent material from coming up into the esophagus overnight. That could be accomplished with a hospital bed, for example, or by elevating the head of the bed on blocks, which is not convenient for a lot of people. I think we may recommend that, but a lot of folks don't find that uh, possible really to do. Um, so those are some basic diet and lifestyle modifications. Uh, weight loss can be very helpful. So if someone is overweight or obese, uh, they may benefit from even losing a few pounds. It can go a long way to improve reflux. Uh, and then we have medications. So the classic medications are the proton pump inhibitors like Prilosec, Nexium, uh, Protonix, Dexalan. So those are, are several medications on that list. Uh, and those, those can be very effective. Um, and there are others like Zantac, uh, Pepsid. These are uh, histamine type um, receptor antagonists, so those are medications that act slightly differently to reduce the acid secretion in the stomach. And then you have medications like antacids, like Tums, Gaviscon, these types of medications. Um, beyond that, when patients are what we call refractory to pro proton pump inhibitors, then they may, they, may be benefit, uh, they may benefit from taking the next step towards treatment in the form of a mechanical fix for acid reflux, so that uh, is where TIF comes in, uh, other anti-reflux procedures like Nissen fundoplication, which is a type of surgery, or the Lynx procedure, which is another type of surgery. Thanks, you, thank you. And can you give us a brief overview of the TIF procedure? Um, it is minimally invasive, so if you could talk about that minimally invasive approach. Absolutely. So I think one important um, component of any of these is to make sure that we are uh, diagnosing the problem correctly. 
Um, and so before we do a TIF procedure or recommend any type of anti-reflux procedure, it's important for us to know that we're going to be giving a, a benefit uh, to the patient. So the first thing that we do is a, an evaluation to make sure that we think GERD is really the, the problem. Um, some folks have symptoms that may be um, either uh, similar to GERD symptoms but not due to GERD, or they may have atypical GERD symptoms that can be caused by a few different things. And so it's important for us to really hone in and make sure we know that GERD is truly the problem. So um, for example, Mary had a lot of upper respiratory type of symptoms, sort of atypical uh, symptoms of um, GERD, which uh, a lot of ENT doctors may look down and see some redness in the back of the throat. They may uh, diagnose something called LPR, which stands for laryngopharyngeal reflux, and that's uh, something that can cause hoarseness, sinus problems, uh, sort of feeling of a lump in the back of the throat, um, and that can be caused by GERD. It could also be caused by allergies or postnasal drip, other uh, factors that can play into that. So we will often uh, start with uh, an evaluation that might include endoscopy to look down in the back of the throat and in the esophagus and into the stomach to assess the anatomy, to look for any changes uh, like inflammation or ulcers that could come from acid reflux. Uh, and then we frequently will perform an acid monitoring test, which comes in a couple of different forms, but the, the more widely used one that we use uh, typically is a little implanted capsule that goes into the uh, esophagus and sits in the lining of the esophagus temporarily. That's put in at the time of the endoscopy. Uh, then that sits there monitoring the acid level and it sends wireless information to a, a little computer, a little about the size of a, of a phone, iPhone, and uh, it records for 48 hours or so. And then that little capsule will fall off on its own, pass through the digestive tract, um, and uh, we don't need to retrieve that. Uh, then we're able to view the 48 hours of information about how much acid reflux is really going on. So for example, in Mary's case, we saw um, a small hiatal hernia, which uh, is a little gap at the bottom of the esophagus that uh, indicates maybe the valve isn't functioning correctly. Um, and uh, on the Bravo capsule study, that she had significant amounts of acid reflux. So that gave us information that perhaps you know, her symptoms really were due to acid reflux. So that's step one, is making sure we make the right diagnosis. Um, and then the next step is to go ahead with the procedure. So on the, um, uh, for a TIF, what we're trying to accomplish is tightening that valve at the bottom of the esophagus. And if there is a hiatal hernia, uh, to try and fix that uh, as part of that process. So what we'll do for a TIF is, again, an endoscopy. So we take a look down in the esophagus, um, and we use a device to uh, lengthen the esophagus a little bit at the bottom and wrap it around a little bit tighter. So the valve that's normally a couple of centimeters is then at the end uh, a few centimeters longer and tighter, and that creates a, a valve at the bottom of the esophagus. And do you do this at the same time, uh, the hiatal hernia repair, at the same time as you do the TIF procedure? We do. So it's part of the procedure. By doing the TIF procedure, it actually uh, reduces that hernia as a consequence of the procedure itself. Um, so it can, it can be effective in repairing a small hiatal hernia. If there's a hernia that is larger uh, than two centimeters, uh, for example, a three, four, five centimeter hernia, which would be sort of medium size. Uh, a patient with that problem may benefit from a TIF, but it would be combined with um, a surgical hiatal hernia repair. So typically in that case, we would do a very similar process overall. We bring the patient in, this is done in the hospital. Um, we put in a breathing tube under anesthesia, so the patient's very comfortable, and then they would undergo a laparoscopic surgery to fix the hernia and then we follow immediately with the TIF procedure at the same, in the same uh, case, so in the same procedure. Excellent, and, and what is the um, recovery time for uh, a TIF patient? So um, the immediate recovery time after the procedure can be as little as a couple of hours in the, in the hospital, uh, <clears throat> in the post-procedure area, um, or some patients may benefit from staying in the hospital overnight. So. Um, it sort of depends on how they're feeling after the anesthesia and how, um, how symptomatic they might be afterwards. So most patients have some irritation in the back of their throat. Uh, they may have some pain uh, in, in the upper abdomen area. 
Um, sometimes there is some additional pain in the shoulder because of the way the nerves are sort of uh, wired in that area. Um, so most patients will wake up with some discomfort, though it's usually less than if they had undergone a surgery, for example. So we have um, developed a medication regimen during the procedure and after the procedure to try to minimize that discomfort. And so for most of our patients, they wake up in recovery sort of sleepy and groggy. Um, they get some pain medications while they're in the hospital, and then within a, a few hours, then they go home. Um, some patients may need to stay uh, just to maybe receive a little bit more pain medication or nausea medication. Excellent. And then um, I know you mentioned the other treatment options, uh, such as Nissen uh, fundoplication and the Lynx procedure. Could you elaborate on the uh, differences between those two procedures and the TIF procedure? Absolutely. So the TIF procedure, <coughs> again, is trying to accomplish a tighter valve at the bottom of the esophagus. So these other uh, surgical procedures are also attempting to accomplish the same, the same idea overall. <coughs> uh, Nissen fundoplication is a surgery that has been done uh, for many years and is a successful procedure for GERD in a lot of cases. It was previously an open procedure and now laparoscopic uh, surgery. A uh, patient again is put to sleep with uh, anesthesia and then has laparoscopic uh, instruments inserted into the abdomen to mobilize the top part of the stomach and sort of wrap it around the bottom of the esophagus where the valve is uh, that, that leads into the, into the esophagus. And by doing that, a, a, a tighter valve is created. Um, and so that is uh, the sort of the classic GERD tre uh, surgical treatment. There are some downsides with that procedure or any, any procedure in general, but the, the ones specific to a Nissen fundoplication are, of course, post-surgical soreness after the surgery itself. But then a lot of patients will have uh, gas and bloating as, a, as one of the main side effects. And the reason is that that valve is so tight that they're not, allowed, they're not able to um, vent their stomach or sort of belch as they normally would be able to. So that's a normal mechanism that we all have to uh, release some of the air we swallow. And if we're not able to do that, that can create that feeling of bloating. Uh, so a lot of patients might complain of that. Some patients may have some trouble swallowing afterwards, um, and that uh, occasionally needs to be dealt with in, in different ways, sometimes by doing endoscopic treatments. Uh, the Lynx procedure is another surgery uh, that's also done laparoscopically. And uh, that is a little bit different because there's a, uh, an implanted device that goes around the valve. It's a ring of uh, magnetic uh, beads, basically, that forms a string. And so it augments, adds to the force of the va closing of that valve. So when a, a, food, a bite of food goes down, it passes through the magnets, sort of spread apart, and the food goes through, and then it comes back together afterwards to create a tighter valve. And that, uh, many patients may experience some trouble swallowing uh, for a period of time afterwards. Uh, the esophagus is a muscle like any other muscle, so it sort of needs to accommodate to that new tight valve, and that can take a little bit of time. So the downside there is the trouble swallowing and the, uh, the fact that there's an implanted device. So some patients are a little bit wary of having a, a metal object implanted there. It is, these are all successful procedures, and so, um, you know, so some folks may benefit more from one or another. Uh, but I think TIF sort of fills a, a good gap in the uh, treatment options for patients because after medications, previously we either we had surgery or um, just trying more medications. So we had to uh, you know, develop strategies to help treat patients without needing to go to surgery. So TIF is a, it fills this nice place in between medications and surgery where patients can get relief. Wonderful. And then Mary, what was your recovery like? or how you've been feeling since the TIF Great, procedure? Great, since the procedure. Excellent. Um, the hardest part about the recovery was the diet. And what was that like? Well, I'm, I'm glad I was prepared. I read all the literature. And um, my, one of my sisters had jaw surgery and had to have liquids through a straw for six weeks. And she said, when you get to baby food, don't eat the meat. And so between reading what was in the literature and hearing from people who had similar diets, I was fairly well prepared. And because I have garlic and onion allergies, that made it more restrictive. So I became a, and I don't like sweet things, but I did become a jello pudding fan when I got <laughs> to the point where I could have that. And um, I actually made my own egg drop soup when I got to the point where I could have eggs. So I, I, I don't look like it, but I really am a live to eat person instead of eat to live. So food's very important to me. And that was, it was hard. Plus, 
I was trying to keep my husband fed, and it was hard to, it wasn't hard to cook, it was hard to try to cook and not be able to eat the mm -hmm. stuff, but um, it, that was the hardest part for me. And, and the other thing was the lifting restrictions, because I work out a lot, and I babysit two kids, and one of them's three, and one, he comes to me all the time and says, uppy, uppy. He can say, please lift me up. He just <laughs> likes to say, uppy, uppy. So I had to explain to him, I can't pick you up yet. But he didn't understand because he said, well, you look okay, what's wrong? So that was harder for me because I really wanted to pick him up. But I, I think the, one of the most important things is to be well prepared, to yeah. read the literature, and if, if you can, um, understand what you can eat and when and my favorite food in the world is tomatoes and that was on the at the end of the nice. diet list so but I made it through and I'm so glad I did it I, I'm really feeling better overall wonderful and, and Dr. Harnden what is your protocol how long do um, you know TIF patients uh, have to be on a, a diet mm -hmm. of uh, solid or I'm sorry liquids and not solid foods yeah. so before the procedure, uh, there are no real dietary restrictions. After the procedure, the goal is really to allow the valve that we've created to heal in as best as possible. And uh, so that takes some time. The way that we uh, create the valve is to put in some sutures into the valve. So when we place the, the tissue the way it needs to be for the, for the uh, tighter valve, the sutures hold it in place. But in the end, the body's own healing mechanisms really kind of fuse that area in and make it strong and healthy. And so that process needs to happen before we challenge the valve with a full regular diet. So uh, most patients would describe the hardest part as being the, the diet changes. Um, there are activity limitations afterwards so that you're not increasing the abdominal pressure too much. So there are some weight uh, restrictions uh, and then patients can gradually work back up to their normal activities over several weeks. In terms of the diet, uh, the first few days are thin liquids only, uh, so uh, water, uh, you know, boost shakes, things like that. Um, even ice cream, as long as it's melting and going through the valve in a, in a thin liquid. And then after that, patients graduate up to soft foods, like smoothies, uh, thin purees, um, those types of foods. And then over the next several weeks, uh, they graduate up to just a regular soft diet, things like eggs, uh, tofu, very well cooked vegetables, uh, and then gradually introduce uh, other soft foods, um, oatmeal, etc., and then eventually back up to breads and meats and you know steak, things like that. Ground meats can go in a little bit earlier, uh, but the total duration back up to normal diet is six weeks. Six weeks, perfect. And I think we might have a question um, from Facebook. Yeah, we have a couple that have come in. Um, one says, "I heard recently that reflux is not just acid." Uh, if that's true, uh, can non-acid reflux cause problems? Yes, it can. So uh, GERD in general can uh, result in some unwanted health consequences. So you can have inflammation in the esophagus. Uh, Barrett's esophagus is a precancerous condition that can, that can happen. You can have material that goes down into the lungs, as we heard about in, in the case of pneumonia or uh, other chronic lung diseases. And so it's not just the acid in the material that's coming up that can cause those, those problems. There's bile and food and other, other uh, contents in the stomach that can come up and cause these problems. So by taking proton pump inhibitors, that helps in some ways because it reduces the acid. So there's less uh, injury from acid erosion in the esophagus. And we know that proton pump inhibitors can help with some of the unwanted health consequences of reflux, but there still may be uh, material coming up even if you're taking that medication so you may feel better but there still may be some material that comes into the esophagus and causes some of these unwanted consequences such as pneumonia. Excellent. I think we have one more. Uh, yes we do. Uh, can TIF be done on a patient that has had a failed Nissen fund application or Lynx implant um, and are you seeing these patients? Uh, so so it would not be something we would do on a after a Lynx procedure uh, but it is something that can be done after uh, a failed or a successful Nissen procedure that has simply sort of worn out. So a Nissen uh, or any um, anti-reflux procedure may over time um, uh, sort of loosen a little bit. Uh, so a Nissen, uh, which is the surgery where the stomach is wrapped around the bottom of the esophagus, 
that's a valve that's created out of the patient's own tissue. And so you can have some loosening of that area over time. So we may evaluate a patient and look down with a camera and we see that it, it's sort of wide open at that point. And that's uh, an area that we can uh, treat with uh, a TIF. So we can go down and create the same valve that we would normally using the, the tissue that's already there. So we can, we can uh, tighten a Nissen fundoplication back to create a tight valve. Do we have any more questions? Uh, one of the questions is surrounding uh, insurance coverage. If I'm a candidate, will insurance cover my procedure? So insurance uh, will cover the procedure. Um, we have an authorization process to make sure that that's the case before we do the procedure. Uh, we have a, a company that can help with managing that. Uh, so that is a factor for any patient for any medical procedure, including this one. We've had more, <coughs> more and more success getting this approved, um, and so we're seeing a lot of patients who are benefiting from uh, insurance approval for the, for the procedure. Wonderful. Are we, we have one more? One more. Um, what would preclude me from being a TIF candidate? So that's a great question. So again, we really want to make sure that we're going to give a good benefit to a patient and not cause other problems. So. If someone has symptoms that are not clearly due to reflux, or we do the pre-procedure evaluation and we find that the, the maybe reflux is not the most likely cause of the symptoms, then that may be an area where we, we say maybe we should uh, hold off and not do the procedure because we wouldn't want to put someone through uh, any kind of medical procedure and then not have improvement in the symptoms afterwards. There are some um, anatomic considerations. We talked a little bit about hiatal hernia so if someone has a larger hiatal hernia, uh, if, it's, if it's large enough, they may benefit from going to surgery directly rather than having a TIF procedure. Uh, again, for a medium-sized hiatal hernia, it's, it may be uh, beneficial, but they may need to have the hernia repaired surgically at the same time. Uh, some folks um, ask about if they have trouble swallowing and sort of is there a workup for that. If someone does not have any trouble swallowing, then uh, we could go ahead with the procedure. If someone does have significant trouble with swallowing, then we may do some testing ahead of time to make sure there's not a problem with the esophagus function that would cause more problems if we were to create a tighter valve at the bottom of the esophagus. So there may be some conditions where a TIF procedure wouldn't be, you know, wouldn't be the ideal procedure. Would a, uh, a patient who has uh, had a sleeve, would they be able to, to get the TIF procedure? That's a great question. So that brings up the idea of the uh, anatomic limitations of the, of the procedure as well. Uh, so no. So a, a patient with a sleeve uh, gastrectomy, which is a weight loss um, procedure, or certain other uh, stomach surgeries may not be a candidate simply because the device that's used to create the valve wouldn't really fit within that area. So if, the, if someone's had prior stomach surgeries, um, then they may not be a good candidate. Okay. Thank you. And then, Amiri, um, how, how has your life been since the TIF procedure? I haven't had What's to see the allergist. I haven't had to take allergy shots. Um, I'm back to working out again and lifting little Braxton. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's better. Good. I really, the clearing my throat thing was actually going on for years. And like I said, I thought it was um, lactose intolerance. I retired quite a while ago, but when I was working and had to lead meetings, I, I was annoying me and I kept thinking, I felt sorry for the people in the meeting because every sentence or two I had to go, <clears throat> so I don't have to do that anymore and it's great. Oh, that's wonderful. I think we have another question. We do. We had one specific to the hyal hernia size. Mm -hmm. At what point would um, I really not be a candidate for TIF due to a large hernia such as 8 centimeters? And if it was repaired, would I still be a candidate? Mm -hmm. So, typically a straightforward TIF can be done on a patient who has a, a hernia up to two centimeters. Uh, I would draw the line somewhere around five centimeters for doing a combined surgical hernia repair with a TIF. I think a hernia above that size, the chance of having a, uh, not necessarily a complication but a failure of the procedure uh, goes up uh, once you get into that, that size. So to go forward with an anti-reflux surgery like a traditional Nissen would probably be better in that case. Do we have any other questions? If I'm interested in uh, a TIF procedure, where could I find someone who performs it? Yes, so um, I can answer that. Okay. 
Uh, you can find a TIF trained physician in your area at our website at girdhelp.com uh, or you can uh, find on our Facebook page girdhelp.com uh, our physician locator you can get a, um, a physician in your area that is TIF trained. Um, thank you so much for joining us today and thank you Dr. Harnden and Mary for joining us and uh, thank you Facebook. <laughs>